Excuse me. Uh, we want to give you an opportunity to have opening statements, as I've been reminded. So, General Austin, you're recognized. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss our recent drawdown and evacuation operations in Afghanistan. I'm pleased to be joined by Generals Milley and McKenzie, who I know will be able to provide you with additional context. I'd like to make a few points before turning it over to you and to them. And first, I want to say how incredibly proud I am of the men and women of the U.S. Armed Forces, who conducted themselves with tremendous skill and professionalism throughout the war, the drawdown, and the evacuation. Over the course of our nation's longest war, 2,461 of our fellow Americans made the ultimate sacrifice, along with more than 20,000 who still bear the wounds of war, some of which cannot be seen on the outside. And we can discuss and debate the decisions, the policies, and the turning points since April of this year, when the President made clear his intent to end American involvement in this war. And we can debate the decisions over 20 years that led us to this point. But I know that you agree with me that one thing not open to debate is the courage and the compassion of our service members who, along with their families, served and sacrificed to ensure that our homeland would never again be attacked the way it was on 9-11. I had the chance to speak with many of them during my trip to the Gulf region a few weeks ago, including the Marines who lost 11 of their teammates at the Abbey Gate in Kabul on the 26th of August. And I've never been more humbled and inspired. They are rightfully proud of what they accomplished and the lives they saved in such a short span of time. In fact, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that issue of time. The reason that our troops were able to get there so quickly is because we planned for just such a contingency. We began th thinking about the possibilities of a non-combatant evacuation as far back as this spring. Indeed, by late April, two weeks after the President's decision, military planners had crafted a number of evacuation scenarios. In mid-May, I ordered Central Command to make preparations for potential NEO. And two weeks later, I began pre-positioning forces in the region to include three infantry battalions. And on the 10th of August, we ran another tabletop exercise around a non-combatant evacuation scenario. We wanted to be ready, and we were. In fact, by the time that the State Department called for a NEO, leading elements of the 24th Marine Expeditionary Unit were already on the ground in Kabul. And before that weekend was out, another 3,000 or so ground troops had arrived, including elements of the 82nd Airborne. But let's be clear, those first two days were difficult. We all watched with alarm the images of Afghans rushing the runway and our aircraft. We all remember the scenes of confusion outside the airport. But within 48 hours, our troops restored order and process began to take hold. Our soldiers, airmen, and Marines, in partnership with our allies and partners and our State Department colleagues, secured the gates, took control of airport operations, and set up a processing system for the tens of thousands of people they would be manifesting onto airplanes. They and our commanders exceeded all expectations. We plan to execute between 70 and 80,000, we plan to evacuate between 70 and 80,000 people. They evacuated more than 124,000. We plan to move between five and 9,000 people per day. On average, they move slightly between more than 7,000 per day. On military aircraft alone, we flew more than 387 sorties, averaging nearly 23 per day. And at the height of this operation, an aircraft was taking off every 45 minutes. And not a single sortie was missed for maintenance, fuel, or logistical problems. It was the largest air, air, airlift conducted in U.S. history, and it was executed in 17 days. Was it perfect? Of course not. We moved so many people so quickly out of Kabul that we ran into capacity and screening problems 
at intermediate staging bases outside Afghanistan. And we're still working to get Americans out who wish to leave. And we did not get out all of our Afghan allies enrolled in a special immigrant visa program. We take that seriously, and that's why we're working across the interagency to continue facilitating their departure. Even with no military presence on the ground, that part of our mission is not over. And tragically, lives were lost. Several Afghans killed climbing aboard an aircraft on that first day. Thirteen brave U.S. service members and dozens of Afghan civilians killed in a terrorist attack on the 26th. And we took as many as 10 innocent lives in a drone strike on the, on the 29th. Non-combatant evacuations remain amongst the most, among the most challenging military operations, even in the best of circumstances. And the circumstances in August were anything but ideal. Extreme heat, a landlocked country, no government, a highly dynamic situation on the ground, and an active, credible, and lethal terrorist threat. In a span of just two days, from the 13th to the 15th of August, we went from working alongside a democratically elected longtime partner government to coordinating warily with a longtime enemy. We operated in a deeply dangerous environment. And it proved a lesson in pragmatism and professionalism. We learned a lot of other lessons, too, about how to turn an Air Force base in Qatar to an international airport overnight, and about how to rapidly screen, process, and manifest large numbers of people. Nothing like this has ever been done before, and no other military in the world could have pulled it off, and I think that is crucial. Now, I know that members of this committee will have questions on many things, such as why we turned over Bagram Airfield, and how real is our over-the-horizon capability, and why didn't we start evacuation sooner, and why didn't we stay longer to get more people out. So let me take each in turn. Retaining Bagram would have required putting as many as 5,000 U.S. troops in harm's way just to operate and defend it, and it would have contributed, contributed little to the mission that we've been assigned, and that was to protect and defend the embassy, which was some 30 miles away. That distance from Kabul also rendered Bagram of little value in the evacuation. The staying at Bagram, even for counterterrorism purposes, meant staying at war in Afghanistan, something that the President made clear that he would not do. As for over-the-horizon operations, when we use that term, we refer to assets and target analysis that come from outside the country in which the operation occurs. These are effective and fairly common operations. Indeed, just days ago, we conducted one such strike in Syria, eliminating a senior al-Qaeda figure. Over-the-horizon operations are difficult, but absolutely possible. And the intelligence that supports them comes from a variety of sources and not just boots, just U.S. boots on the ground. As for when we started evacuations, we offered input to, state, to the State Department's decision mindful of their concerns that moving too soon might actually cause the very collapse of the Afghan government that we all wanted to avoid, and that moving too late would put our people and our operations at greater risk. And as I said, the fact that our troops were on the ground so quickly is due in large part to our planning and our prepositioning of forces. And as for the mission's end, my judgment remains that extending beyond the end of August would have greatly imperiled our people, and our mission. The Taliban made clear <coughs> that their cooperation would end on the 1st of September. And as you know, we face grave and growing threats from ISIS-K. Staying longer than we did would have made it even more dangerous for our people and would not have significantly changed the number of evacuees we could get out. Now, as we consider these tactical issues today, we must also ask ourselves some equally tough questions about the wider war itself and pause to think about the lessons that we have learned over the past 20 years. Did we have the right strategy? Did we have too many strategies? Did we put too much faith in our ability to build effective Afghan institutions, an army, an air force, a police force, and government ministries? We helped build a state, Mr. Chairman, but we could not forge a nation. 
The fact that the Afghan army that we and our partners trained simply melted away, in many cases without firing a shot, took us all by surprise, and it would be dishonest to claim otherwise. We need to consider some uncomfortable truths. That we didn't fully comprehend the depth of corruption and poor leadership in the senior ranks. That we didn't grasp the damaging effect, <coughs> effect of frequent and unexplained rotations by President Ghani of his commanders. That we didn't anticipate the snowball effect caused by the deals that the Taliban commanders struck with local leaders in the wake of the Doha Agreement. And that the Doha Agreement itself had a demoralizing effect on Afghan soldiers. And finally, that we failed to grasp that there was only so much for which and for whom many of the Afghan forces would fight. We provided the Afghan military with equipment and aircraft and the skills to use them. Over the years, they often fought bravely. Tens of thousands of Afghan soldiers and police died. But in the end, we couldn't provide them with the will to win, at least not all of them. And as a veteran of that war, I am personally reckoning with all of that. But I hope, as I said at the outset, that we do not allow a debate about how this war ended to cloud our pride in the way that our people fought it. They prevented another 9-11. They showed extraordinary courage and compassion in the, war's last, in the war's last days. And they made lasting progress in Afghanistan that the Taliban will find difficult to reverse and that the international community should work hard to preserve. Now, our service members and civilians face a new mission, helping these Afghan evacuees move on to new lives and new places. And they are performing that one magnificently as well. I spent time with, with some of them up at Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst just yesterday. I know that you share my profound gratitude and respect for their service, their courage, and professionalism, and I appreciate the support that this committee continues to provide them and their families. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, General Milley, I believe you have a statement. Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, and thank you for the opportunity to be here with Secretary Austin and General McKenzie to discuss Afghanistan. As you mentioned up front, uh, we submitted matters uh, for the record, a lengthy statement of this uh, cut-down oral version, and I know it got to you late. Uh, during the past 20 years, uh, the men and women of the United States military, along with our allies and partners, fought the Taliban, brought Osama bin Laden to justice, denied al-Qaeda sanctuary, and protected our homeland for two consecutive decades. Over 800,000 of us in uniform served in Afghanistan. Most importantly, 2,461 of us gave the ultimate sacrifice, while 20,698 of us were wounded in action, and countless others of us suffer the invisible wounds of war. There's no doubt in my mind that our efforts prevented an attack on the homeland from Afghanistan, which was our core original mission. And everyone who served in that war should be proud. Your service mattered. Beginning in 2011, we steadily drew down our troop numbers, consolidated and closed bases, and retrograded equipment from Afghanistan. At the peak in 2011, we had 97,000 U.S. troops alongside 41,000 NATO troops in Afghanistan. Ten years later, when Ambassador Kalizade signed the Doha Agreement with Mullah Berater on 29 February 2020, the United States had 12,600 U.S. troops with 8,000 NATO and 10,500 contractors. This has been a 10-year multi-administration drawdown, not a 19-month or 19-day NEO. Under the Doha Agreement, the U.S. would begin to withdraw its forces, contingent upon Taliban meeting certain conditions, which would lead to a political agreement between the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan. There were seven conditions applicable to the Taliban and eight conditions applicable to the United States. While the Taliban did not attack U.S. forces, which was one of the conditions, it failed to fully honor any, any other condition under the Doha Agreement. And perhaps most importantly for U.S. national security, 
the Taliban has never renounced al-Qaeda or broke its affiliation with them. We, the United States, adhered to every condition. In the fall of 2020, my analysis was that an accelerated withdrawal without meeting specific and necessary conditions risks losing the substantial gains made in Afghanistan, damaging U.S. worldwide credibility, and could precipitate a general collapse of the ANSF and the Afghan government, resulting in a complete Taliban takeover or general civil war. That was a year ago. My assessment remained consistent throughout. Based on my advice and the advice of the commanders, then Secretary of Defense Esper submitted a memorandum on 9 November recommending to maintain U.S. forces at a level between about 2,500 and 4,500 in Afghanistan until conditions were met for further reduction. Two days later, on 11 November 2020, I received an unclassified signed order directing the United States military to withdraw all forces from Afghanistan no later than 15 January 2021. After further discussions regarding the risks associated with such a withdrawal, the order was rescinded. On 17 November, we received a new order to reduce levels to 2,500 plus enabling forces no later than 15 January. When President Biden was inaugurated, there were approximately 3,500 U.S. troops, 5,400 NATO troops, and 6,300 contractors in Afghanistan with a specified task of train, advise, and assist, along with a small contingent of counterterrorism forces. The strategic situation at inauguration was stalemate. The Biden administration, through the National Security Council process, conducted a rigorous interagency review of the situation in Afghanistan in February, March, and April. During this process, the views of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all of us, the CENTCOM commander, General McKenzie, the US-4A commander, General Miller, and myself were all given serious consideration by the administration. We provided a broad range of options in our assessment of their potential outcomes. The cost, benefit, risk to force, and risk to mission were evaluated against the national security objectives of the United States. On 14 April, the President announced his decision, and the U.S. military received a change of mission to retrograde all U.S. military forces, maintain a small contingency force of six to 700 to protect the embassy in Kabul until the Department of State could coordinate contractor security support, and also to assist Turkey to maintain the Karzai International Airport and transition the U.S. military to an over-the-horizon counterterrorism support and security force assistance. It is clear, it is obvious, the war in Afghanistan did not end on the terms we wanted, with the Taliban now in power in Kabul. Although the NEO was unprecedented and is the largest air evacuation in history, evacuating 124,000 people, it came at an incredible cost of 11 Marines, one soldier, and a Navy corpsman. Those 13 gave their lives so that people they never met will have an opportunity to live in freedom. And we must remember that the Taliban was and remains a terrorist organization, and they still have not broken ties with al-Qaeda. I have no illusions who we are dealing with. It remains to be seen whether or not the Taliban can consolidate power or if the country will further fracture into civil war. But we must continue to protect the United States of America and its people from terrorist attacks coming from Afghanistan. A reconstituted al-Qaeda or ISIS with aspirations to attack the United States is a very real possibility. And those conditions to include activity in ungoverned spaces could present themselves in the next 12 to 36 months. That mission will be much harder now but not impossible, and we will continue to protect the American people. Strategic decisions have strategic consequences. Over the course of four presidents, 12 secretaries of defense, seven chairmen, 10 CENTCOM commanders, 20 commanders in Afghanistan, hundreds of congressional delegation visits, and 20 years of congressional oversight, there are many lessons to be learned. 
Two, specific to the military that we need to take a look at, and we will, is did we mirror image the development of the Afghan National Army? And the second is the rapid collapse, unprecedented rapid collapse of the Afghan military in only 11 days in August. However, one lesson must never be forgotten. Every soldier, sailor, airman, and Marine who served there in Afghanistan for 20 consecutive years protected our country from attack by terrorists. And for that, they should be forever proud, and we should be forever grateful. Thank you, Chairman. And if I could, I, I know uh, that there's some issues in the media that are of deep concern to many members on the committee. And with your permission, I'd like to address those for a minute or two. Again, I've submitted memoranda for the committee to take a look at. You may proceed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've, I've served this nation for 42 years. I spent years in combat, and I buried a lot of my troops who died while defending this country. My loyalty to this nation, its people, and the Constitution hasn't changed and will never change as long as I have a breath to give. My loyalty is absolute, and I will not turn my back on the fallen. With respect to the Chinese calls, I routinely communicated with my counterpart, General Lee, with the knowledge and coordination of civilian oversight. I am specifically directed to communicate with the Chinese by Department of Defense guidance, the policy dialogue system. These military-to-military -military communications at the highest level are critical to the security of the United States in order to deconflict military actions, manage crisis, and present, prevent war between great powers that are armed with the world's most deadliest weapons. The calls on 30 October and 8 January were coordinated before and after with Secretary Esper and Acting Secretary Miller's staffs and the interagency. The specific purpose of the October and January calls were to generate or were generated by concerning intelligence, which caused us to believe the Chinese were worried about an attack on them by the United States. I know, I am certain that President Trump did not intend to attack the Chinese. And it is my directed responsibility, and it was my directed responsibility by the Secretary to convey that intent to the Chinese. My task at that time was to de-escalate. My message again was consistent. Stay calm, steady, and de-escalate. We are not going to attack you. At Secretary of Defense Esper's direction, I made a call to General Lee on 30 October. Eight people sat in that call with me, and I read out the call within 30 minutes of the call ending. On 31 December, the Chinese requested another call with me. The Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asia Pacific Policy helped coordinate my call, which was then scheduled for 8 January, and he made a preliminary call on 6 January. Eleven people attended that call with me, and readouts of this call were distributed to the interagency that same day. Shortly after my call ended with General Lee, I personally informed both Secretary of State Pompeo and White House Chief of Staff Meadows about the call, among other topics. Soon after that, I attended a meeting with Acting Secretary Miller, where I briefed him on the call. Later that same day, on 8 January, Speaker of the House Pelosi called me to inquire about the President's ability to launch nuclear weapons. I sought to assure her that nuclear launch is governed by a very specific and deliberate process. She was concerned and made, very, or made various personal references characterizing the President. I explained to her that the President is the sole nuclear launch authority and he doesn't launch them alone, and that I am not qualified to determine the mental health of the President of the United States. There are processes, protocols, and procedures in place, and I repeatedly assured her that there is no chance of an illegal, unauthorized, or accidental launch. By presidential directive and secretary of defense directives, the chairman is part of the process to ensure the president is fully informed when determining the use of the world's deadliest weapons. By law, I am not in the chain of command, and I know that. However, by presidential directive and DOD instruction, I am in the chain of communication 
to fulfill my legal statutory role as the President's primary military advisor. After the Speaker Pelosi call, I convened a short meeting in my office with key members of my staff to refresh all of us on the procedures which we practice daily at the action officer level. Additionally, I immediately informed Acting Secretary of Defense Miller of, Sec or of uh, Speaker Pelosi's phone call. At no time was I attempting to change or influence the process, usurp authority, or insert myself in the chain of command. But I am expected, I am required to give my advice and ensure that the President is fully informed on military matters. I am submitting for the record a more detailed and unclassified memoranda that I believe you all now have, although late. And I welcome a thorough walkthrough on every single one of these events. And I'd be happy in a classified session to talk in detail about the intelligence that drove these calls. I'm also happy to make available any email, phone logs, memoranda, witnesses, or anything else you need to understand these events. My oath is to support the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I will never turn my back on that oath. I firmly believe in civilian control of the military as a bedrock principle essential to the health of this republic. And I'm committed to ensuring that the military stays clear of domestic politics. I look forward to your questions and thank you, Chairman, for the extra time. Uh, thank you, General. Uh, General McKenzie, I understand you do not have a statement. Is that correct? So I'll waive my, my statement in order to get us back on schedule. Thank you very much, General.